Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Nick Minot. Uh, I'm from the International Food Policy Research Institute, and I'm very pleased to moderate today's webinar, uh, the title of which is COVID-19 and Agricultural Value Chains, Impacts and Adaptations. The webinar is hosted by the CGIR Research Program on Policies, Institutions, and Markets. Um, and uh, two of these studies have been funded by PIM Flagship 3, which focuses on inclusive and efficient value chains. A Flagship 3 team has been conducting research on how value chains can be, can be strengthened to generate more benefits for smallholders and small and medium enterprises. The other two uh, studies were funded by the COVID-19 Hub. This is a P, um, PIM level um, program to support research on the impact of COVID-19 in various areas, including food value chains. Let me first uh, briefly introduce our speakers. Uh, the first presentation will be given by Ben Belton and Diego Naziri. Uh, ben is the global lead uh, uh, on social and economic inclusion at World Fish. Uh, Diego is value chain and post-harvest specialist at the International Potato Center, SIP, um, and uh, leader of nutritious food and value added through post-harvest innovation, a research flagship uh, under the CGR research program on roots, tubers, and bananas, RTV. Second presentation will be given by Gashao Abati. He is a research fellow at IFPRI based in uh, Washington. Uh, the third presentation will be given by um, Habud Ayat Mohammed Saifal Islam. He's with the um, uh, he's a professor at the Department of Agriculture Economics and at Bangladesh Agriculture University in Maiman Singh, Bangladesh. Uh, the uh, presentation will also be given. This is the third. Um, this presentation will also be given by Marcel Gatto. Uh, he's an agricultural economist with SIP, the International Potato Center. Uh, and uh, the Last presentation uh, will be given by Humnath Bandari um, and uh, GM Monirul Alam. Uh, Humnath is senior agricultural economist and country representatives of country representative of the International Rice Research Institute in Bangladesh. Uh, Monirul uh, is professor in the Faculty of Agricultural Economics and Rural Development at Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman Agricultural University in Bangladesh. Um, I should mention that we're changing the order so that um, Marcel and uh, Saifal's presentation will not be third, it will be fourth, but um, you'll um, see that as we, as we go along. Um, and uh, finally, we're pleased to have uh, Sudha Narayan um, serve as discussant for our webinar today. Sudha is a research fellow with IFPRI in the South Asia Regional Office in New Delhi. Uh, she's been working on the impact of COVID-19 since the beginning of the pandemic. So it'll be great to have her uh, comments and feedback. So before I hand over for the first presentation, uh, I just want to put in a few notes on how we'll be proceeding. Uh, the presentations in the first part of the webinar will last about 40 minutes. In other words, maybe 10 minutes uh, per presentation. Uh, then we'll have um, remarks, comments from uh, Sudha, and then a Q&A session. Uh, we would really like to hear from you, so please use the chat window on the right side of your screens to send your comments and questions at any time during the webinar. Uh, when you ask your question, please let us know who and uh, who you are and where you are from, uh, what organization you represent, for example. Um, and finally, the webinar is being recorded uh, and will be available on the PIM website shortly after the live event. Um, okay, so in this first presentation, Ben Belton and Diego Naziri will present how small-scale traders, wholesalers, and processors in the potato and fish value chains in Kenya have pivoted uh, to cope with and adapt to changing circumstances brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, with that, over to you, Ben and Diego. Thank you, Nick. So, as you've said, uh, we'll be presenting today about pivots by actors in the midstream of the potato and fish value chains in Kenya uh, in response to COVID-19. And this is based on some research that was uh, funded by the COVID-19, the CG COVID-19 hub. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, so some a piece of research done by the, the, the COVID-19 hub identified that there was a, a real lack of information about the impacts of COVID-19 on actors in the midstreams of value chains. Um, and so for this study, we've chosen to focus on uh, four sets of actors, two in trading, so small itinerant brokers, and then larger wholesalers, and then two sets of processors, small uh, and, and medium stroke large. Um, uh, these are in the potato and the fish value chains, and we've adopted this, exactly the same methodology to both value chains. We focused on three uh, production zones that are common to both uh, fish and potato, but have slightly different characteristics, and then on two uh, major cities, Nairobi and Mombasa. Um, and we conducted the survey over the phone. Um, we uh, asked about three recall periods, so July 2021, 2020, and 2019. So 2019 being before the pandemic, 2020, uh, July 2020, just after the first lockdown, and 2021, one year on. Um, and in total, we interviewed more than 500 actors in the potato value chain and more than 400 in the fish value chain. Next slide, please. So the first finding is that there was a, a massive reduction in sales in 2020 relative to 2019 in both value chains, followed by a slow and partial recovery. Um, so although most businesses in most value chain segments kept operating, there was a huge drop in weekly sales. Uh, so this graph is a sales index where the, the value uh, for all actors for 2019 is 100. And you can see that um, across all of the different actors in the potato value chain, uh, sales fell by about 80% in 2020 relative to 2019, and by about 60% for actors in the fish value chain. Um, and that there was a slight recovery in 2021, but still not back up to 2019 levels. Um, and the respondents to the survey reported higher prices uh, of transport and difficulties accessing transport um, as a very widespread problem that uh, sort of hampered their business in 2020. Next slide, please. So the next finding is that there were divergent effects on prices for fish and potato. So this graph is another index. Um, this time it's a price index for, for sales prices where 2019 is 100. And you can see for all of the actors in the fish value chain, sales prices jumped considerably in 2020 and then stayed high and the opposite pattern for the potato value chain. Um, so what explains these different patterns? Well. In the case of fish, supply became very constrained. There were curfews that present, prevented fishing taking place overnight. Um, overland trade from Uganda was disrupted and imports of fish from China were stopped. Whereas in the potato value chain, uh, the peak season for, for potato uh, supply uh, coincided with um, restrictions on, on uh, access to transport and markets and low demand and, and then surplus uh, potato. Um, we saw that actors um, tried to, uh, to adapt to this by selling more to the local area. Um, and also we saw a shift to selling to more directly to consumers and to smaller buyers um, and using smaller forms of transport. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the third point is that there was increasing uh, concentration that started to take place. So this is shown by the Gini coefficient of sales of these actors. Um, you can see that on average, the Gini coefficient or the market concentration for all actors in the fish value chain is a lot higher than in the potato value chain. And we think this is because the actors in each node of the fish value chain are much more heterogeneous, much more diverse than in the potato value chain. Um, but you can see, particularly for the potato value chain, there's a trend towards greater concentration, particularly in 2020, but continuing in 2021. Uh, perhaps as, as weaker actors lost part of their market share. Uh, and I'll hand over now to Diego. So thank you, Ben, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, in our study, we also investigated other responses deployed by traders and processors in the face of the pandemic. These included changes in the use of ICT tools. So we ask if they have ever used the telephone for concluding a business transaction. In the case of potato, 25% of the respondents indicated so. 
And out of these, 55% and nine started and 9% increased this practice in response to the pandemic. While for the remaining 35%, the use of phone was not linked to the pandemic. In other words, they were already doing that before the pandemic, or they would have done it anyway. Out of those for which the pandemic was the reason for starting or increasing the use of phone for business transaction, less than 10% expect to cease or reduce this practice once the pandemic comes to an end. In the case of fish, Unlike for potato, the vast majority of traders and processors have used the phone for business transactions. However, similarly to potato, most of them have either started or increased in the response of COVID-19 and do not plan to revert this practice at the end of the pandemic. When we ask if they ever search for customers online or through social media, we have found quite similar results, although this was far less common than the use of phones in, in both in both chains. Next slide. With regard to electronic payments for sending and receiving money, this has been done by 50% by and 80% of respondents in the potato and fish value chain respectively. Again, the pandemic seems to have been an important driver for increased adoption of this practice, and most respondents do not plan to abandon it in the years to come. We also looked at storage, and found that storing for over three days was quite common in both chains, but the pandemic seems to have contributed to increase adoption of this practice, particularly for fish. Interesting, in this case, most people who reported an increase in storage as a response to COVID-19 plan to revert to the pre-pandemic situation once this is over. Next. An additional aspect that we investigated was the change in formal contracts and informal agreements along the chain. As expected, we found that informal agreements are far more common than formal contracts. We also found that both the, these types of arrangements were more frequent in the fish value chain, likely reflecting the higher perishability of this commodity. Between 25 and 45 percent of respondents indicate that COVID was the reason for starting or increasing this practice, and only a minority of them will revert to the previous situation at the end of the pandemic, hopefully. Next. Finally, we also inquired about other specific responses to the pandemic, changing working hours and transportation over a different or longer route to avoid curfew and other restrictions were common responses across both chains. Similarly, the reduction in the number of employees and their salary was a common strategy to cope with the restrictions imposed by the pandemic. However, the use or sale of own resources and assets and the use of credit, including value chain financing, were far more frequent responses among actors in the fish value chain. Next. In conclusion, what are the main take home messages from these preliminary findings? First, as Ben said, we found that most, most businesses have survived, but have recorded a massive reduction in sales in 2020, especially for potato. And the partial recovery in volume sold or process could be observed in 2021. Second, prices were found to follow very different tra trajectories. In the case of potatoes, they fell due to limitations in selling and distributing the output. Instead, in the case of fish, prices rose likely as a consequence of lower domestic supply and imports. Other important results relate to the partial shift to more local sourcing and selling and sales to smaller actors. The pandemic seems to have contributed to increase market concentration in year 2020 and 2021 in comparison to the pre-COVID situation, and this has been reported especially for potato. Our research also found a growing use of ICT tools, including phones, for searching and engaging with business partners and for processing payments. The use of informal agreements with business partners has also increased, but formal contracts much less so. And overall, we also found stronger vertical coordination in the fish value chain. However, it is important to notice that the short-term responses deployed in face of the pandemic are likely to remain, with the exception of uh, increased storage, probably. probably. Thus, so this, uh, that will likely contribute to resilience, to future shocks, to supply and demand in both value chains. 
Finally, we found some commonalities in the short tape term coping strategies across both value chains. However, the mobilization of own saving and assets and increased use of credit to maintain business operations were far more common in the fish than in potato value chain. We speculated that this is related to the fish value chain being more concentrated and the underlying long, longer term relationships and trust within the chain. Another reason might relate to the characteristics of the primary production that in case of fish might be drastically affected by lack of liquidity to purchase the required input for fishing activity, particularly fuel, and for fish farming, specifically feed. However, we are keen to hear from you about other possible explanations. And for now, many thanks for your attention and back to you, Nick. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Ben and Diego, and thank you for keeping to your time slot. Appreciate it. Um, before I introduce our next speaker, I'd like to remind everyone to feel free to submit your questions in the question box on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, we'll have a 25 or 30 minutes uh, Q&A session after the presentations. Um, if the question is for a specific presenter, please let us know so that we can direct the question um, to the right person. In our second presentation, Gashao Abate from IFPRI will present uh, on the performance of Ethiopia's coffee value chain during the COVID-19 pandemic. The floor is yours, Gashao. Thank you very much, uh, Nick. Um, yeah, as mentioned, my presentation will focus on the performance of Ethiopia's coffee value chain actors during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. This is uh, based on a cascading fund survey and it's a joint work with Yalo McConnell and Macadam Dereje. Uh, we're also grateful uh, for the support from PIM, Inveritas, and uh, here we go. Next slide, please. So a quick uh, background, uh, considering the population size, uh, Ethiopia has managed to keep the COVID-19 infection rate relatively low, especially uh, during the first three, four months. Uh, for instance, data from last week, November 25, indicated that uh, so far, uh, a little more than 370,000 people tested positive and the vast majority has uh, recovered. And most of the cases in Ethiopia has been in, in the capital Addis Ababa. So this, the relatively low spread of COVID-19 in the country is uh, partly because the rapid government uh, response, especially uh, at the early stage, uh, which included social distancing measure, awareness creation on preventive measures, also in the form of uh, expanding ex existing social protection uh, responses. Uh, that say the country uh, never went to a full lockdown, which would uh, restrict or severely restrict the movement. So a, a specific context related to the topic uh, at hand, coffee value chain. Uh, the first detected COVID-19 case was confirmed on mid-March. Mid uh, that's essentially after the main coffee harvest and marketing season is completed, uh, especially for red cherries for the 2019 uh, production season. And it happened during uh, the peak international shipment period. Next slide, please. So regarding data, we use two sets of uh, phone surveys, one conducted by IFPRI, the other conducted by Inveritas in collaboration with IFPRI. Uh, the IFPRI phone survey built on a prior coffee value chain survey we conducted in 2014, and it, it represents main coffee producing zones of the country. So we did a follow-up for that uh, sample in, in last June and July, and the phone survey covered uh, the key value chain actors, including smallholder coffee farmers, coffee traders and assemblers, coffee processor, and few coffee exporter. The survey we did uh, in collaboration with Inveritas builds on their database of seven main coffee producing regions in Ethiopia, and we have done two rounds, one in November, December 2020, and the second one in February 2021. Uh, the both surveys focus on changes, assessing changes in access to inputs, markets, marketing patterns, income, food security, and business profit. So the questions in, in this survey essentially make comparison between the 2019 uh, coffee production and marketing season uh, as a pre-pandemic uh, scenario or to, to the 2020 coffee production and marketing season. Next slide, please. 
So I will quickly uh, present these results will be mainly based on the IFPRI survey and uh, I'll, I'll quickly cover the key results by uh, value chain actors to, to start with uh, coffee farmers. Uh, in general, we don't see a match effect because of uh, the pandemic on the scale of operation input use or access to credit. Uh, looking at scale of operation, uh, the share of coffee to total value of production increased in 2020 compared to 2019. Uh, similarly, volume of coffee produced by coffee farmers on average, both for the red cherries and dried whole cherries increased in 2020 uh, compared to 2019. Uh, use of organic uh, inorganic inputs are less common in Ethiopia and that uh, continues to be in 2020 as well. Uh, but uh, the share of farmers who use organic inputs like manure and compost has increased in 2020, which is a labor demanding uh, activity compared to 2019. We look into also adoption of best practices like stamping and weeding. Uh, we didn't see any change uh, before and uh, during the pandemic in terms of share of coffee farmers who adopt those practices. We saw a little bit of effect on labor use. Uh, share of farmers that higher labor decreased slightly in 2020 compared to 2019. And farmer has also reported that finding labor was a bit difficult in 2020 compared to uh, uh, before the pandemic. Access to credit in general decreased in recent years compared to 2014, but we don't see any difference uh, uh, on the share of coffee farmers who received credit uh, between 2019 and 2020. However, we see again here ac access to extension decline during the pandemic and uh, most uh, sizable share of farmers reported that extension agents were not uh, accessible uh, during, during the pandemic compared to uh, before the pandemic. Next slide, please. Again here, uh, on access to buyers and amount of uh, coffee sold by coffee farmers, uh, we don't observe uh, match effects because of uh, the pandemic. Uh, as you can see, 91% of farmers indicated that they had same or more number of coffee buyers in their locality in 2020. And then composition of buyers also remained the same uh, across the three periods. Uh, amount of coffee sold increased in recent years compared to 2014 for both types of uh, coffee, but uh, the, amount, the amount of coffee sold by average coffee har farmer uh, before and during the pandemic still remains uh, comparable. Next slide, please. We also quickly look into the income, food security, and diet quality of coffee farmers uh, regarding income uh, again, the vast majority, about 70%, indicated that uh, the income they received uh, from coffee in, in 2020 uh, was higher compared to 2019. Yet there are 30% who indicated that their income was a little bit lower. They experienced some, some sort of income loss. Uh, but only 24% of those 30% indicated that COVID-19 was a main reason or a factor for, for the income loss. Uh, on food security, a uh, sizable share of coffee farmers in Ethiopia continue to be food insecure in general, but the pandemic did not aggravate the situation. Uh, the distribution of uh, food insecurity level between 2014 and 2020 uh, are still comparable. Uh, we have also some information on diet quality, food consumption at the food group level that we collected uh, uh, in the survey we collaborate with the inver inverters. And uh, again here, coffee farmers consumed uh, on average seven food groups out of 12 uh, on the, on, during the week prior to, to the two rounds of service. And this is considered to be okay, just to put it in the perspective. This is less number of food compared to the number of food groups consumed by average household in Addis Ababa, the capital, where they get supply from all directions, but a more diversified food than households in PSNP or low productive area. Next slide, please. At the coffee trader level, we look into contracts, agreements, inputs, access to buyers and, and, and profits. Again, uh, not much uh, effect to report here. A uh, share of trader with agreements, paid employees, access to credit remained the same uh, before and during the pandemic. 
uh, we take into, we also discuss with them about contractual terms, main source of credit, uh, they also remain largely the same. In terms of access to buyer, 95% of coffee traders, assemblers indicated that they have same or more number of coffee buyers in 2020 compared to 2019. Uh, similarly, close to 70%, the vast majority of coffee traders indicated that they had same or large profit in 2020 compared to 2019. Uh, of those, 30% uh, who experienced some kind of uh, loss or unable to change, they didn't mention uh, also COVID-19 being as, as a major factor. Next slide, please. Uh, the results from coffee processors also paint similar picture, share of coffee to the total value of business for the majority of coffee processor increased in 2020, share of processors with buyers agreement or who received credit also increased in 2020 compared to uh, before the pandemic. And processors in Ethiopia hire more female employees and their number again has increased in 2020. Uh, but we asked the processor if they experienced some kind of delay in payment at the sale, and there was on average about five days more delay for payment uh, in 2020 compared to 2019. Uh, similarly, um, the vast majority of processors indicated that their profit in 2020 was uh, higher than uh, 2019. Next slide, please. Coffee port exporters are relatively affected by the pandemic. It's uh, partly because of the timing, uh, the peak for international coffee shipment coincided with uh, lockdowns in, in uh, coffee importing countries. Uh, as a result, uh, you know, our, our survey results also reflect that 75% of exporters extended contracts or delayed shipment due to COVID-19. 30% experienced uh, cancellation of contract, but in the end, we don't observe uh, that much effect on their scale of uh, operation, uh, partly because some of this disruption was short-lived. Again, here in terms of their profitability, uh, greater than 70% of exporters indicated that they had same or large profit both in 2019 and 2020. We, we ask with normal years, partly because their 29 operation was also affected by the pandemic when it comes to coffee exporters. Next slide, please. So in summary, uh, the coffee value chain in Ethiopia appears to have been very resilient to the pandemic. And this is consistent with other studies uh, we did on dairy value chain and vegetable value chain with other IFPRI colleagues. Uh, and main value chain actors perform relatively well given disruption. And moreover, uh, of the small share of coffee value chain actors that experienced income or profit loss, only small fraction of them mentioned COVID-19 as a reason. Um, however, uh, our assessment is based on simple questions that we can ask uh, over the phone, and it may not adequately, adequately capture the full picture. So we need better measurement of income, business profit, like indicators in, in phone service. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, over to Nick. Great. Uh, thank you, Gashan. Um, very interesting results and kind of surprising in the limited effect or limited impact of, uh, of the pandemic. Um, our third presentation will be given by Humnath Bandari and Manurul Alam. And uh, they will discuss the impact of COVID-19 on the rice and fish value chains in Bangladesh, focusing on government interventions and lessons for building resilience in food value chains. So with that, over to you, Pat and Monroe. Yeah, thank you, Nick. I hope you can hear me well and a good day to everyone. Uh, huh? So we'll be presenting about the COVID-19 impact adaptations and then government uh, policy responses in rice and value chains in Bangladesh. Uh, I'll be presenting the first part about the rice value chain and then Dr. Monerul will present in the uh, fish uh, value chain. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Bangladesh is uh, one of the countries with severely impacted uh, uh, by the COVID. And then if you look at the number, it started in March uh, 2020, and now 1.6 million people have been infected. 
So because of this heavy infection, uh, so there were different waves and government imposed like a, a different type of lockdown, no lockdown, medium lockdown and strict lockdowns. And that uh, these different type of lockdowns have uh, impact on the rice and uh, fish value chains. So we'll be talking about the, some of the results of these impacts. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we use the mixed uh, method approach, so which includes uh, primary data, secondary data, and then the re review of uh, some of the literature. So primary data includes uh, the survey of the rice and fish value chain actors, uh, the different actors. Uh, we conducted this study in the northeast region, as well as the southwest region of the country. And then methodology we basically adopted is comparing before the COVID pandemic and then during the uh, COVID, what are the impacts on the rice and fish value chains. Uh, next slide, please. So let me present some of the results on the, uh, the food value chains or the rice value chains. If you look at here, when the COVID-19 started, the dry season crops like boro rice, potato, wheat, they were about to harvest. During uh, that time, it affected the harvesting of these dry season crops and marketing of these crops. And uh, for the pre-monsoon and then monsoon season, it was about planting time. So access to inputs uh, uh, for this planting of crops uh, was severely affected. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I, I did not present any uh, research findings here. This is, these are more about the summary of the impacts uh, that we got from the different surveys in the different uh, stages of these rice value chains. Uh, so in the input supply, uh, the, the most of the input shops were closed because of the lockdown and that affected the input supply chain was disrupted also the labor availability and then capital for those uh, input uh, suppliers was affected. Uh, for in terms of production, it was the harvesting, si harvesting time. So labor shortage was a critical issue during that time because of that there was some delay in the planting time and harvesting time. Uh, during the monsoon season, availability of inputs like the seeds, uh, fertilizer, pesticide, irrigation, extension services were affected. And because of that, the cost of production increased, uh, labor cost increased like the 20 to 30 percent during this time. Uh, in terms of processing, uh, it's mostly rice processing is done by the rice mills. So most of these were closed. So the supply chain, labor availability, and capital was the main issue for this uh, processing. Uh, in terms of market, the mar most of the markets were closed and then transport were not available. So uh, that has huge impact in terms of import and export. Also, there was huge effect. And in terms of consumption because of loss of jobs uh, and then income, the the dietary pattern had changed. And one of the interesting findings is that during this time, during the COVID time, consumption of rice has increased while the other nutritious food has declined. So these are some of the results that we summarized from this uh, rice value chain and then different actors adopt a different way, like a use of loans at the high interest rate, use of savings, exchange labor, family labor, uh, and then use of digital markets, reduce consumption, and then uh, mostly depend on the safety net. These are some of the important adaptation measures adopted by different uh, value chain actors. Uh, next slide, please. So the, if you look at the rice price uh, during that time, uh, as compared to the before the COVID situation, uh, during the COVID time, both uh, uh, wholesale price as well as the retail price increase. So this is one of the interesting fact. In the first uh, COVID situation, there was some uh, huge uh, food crisis speculation there because of COVID, there will be food crisis. So both rice price, people were starting to stock. So both uh, wholesale price as well as the retail price increase. But if you look at the recent one, 
uh, retail price is still remain the same, but there is huge drop in the, the wholesale price, which is close to the farm gate price. So farmers were suffering from the price, but the consumers were still paying the high price. So this is uh, important difference between the first uh, COVID and then second COVID situation. Next slide, please. Uh, so government uh, adopted different uh, uh, response to address this uh, COVID crisis. So this includes the labor management mechanization uh, subsidy for the different uh, commodities, marketing support. And then one of the important thing is the nutrition gardens government were promoting to improve the nutrition. And then mechanization was one of the, the important program where government utilize uh, different labors and supply combined harvester new reapers to address the labor shortage. Uh, next slide, please. So the, finally, the, in terms of rice, what the government, uh, the farmers or the value chain actors wanted is the good access to market, uh, access to loan, and then the procurement system, storage system, as well as the financial support. These are some of the, the important uh, things uh, the, uh, the value chain actors suggested to the, uh, address uh, to minimize the impact of this COVID-19. So this is about the rice value chain. Now I'd like to hand over to Dr. Moninul to talk about this uh, fish value chain. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. We have only three minutes left. So already you have covered many things, so I'm not going for the details. So please, uh, next slide, please. Uh, I know time is very short, so I'm not going for the details. Fish is very important uh, for Bangladesh, particularly Please, okay. So fish is very important for Bangladesh, uh, particularly food, income, saving, and health for the rural population. So fish sector is also impacted by other sectors, but, uh, okay, let me talk about this. Uh, the two sectors, that is uh, culture and capture fisheries. So culture fisheries is not affected much by the COVID-19, but, uh, Culture fish, which is particularly, um, we can talk about aquaculture that is affected by COVID-19. Uh, you know, the culture fish is consumed by the high and middle income group people, but culture fish is mostly consumed by low and middle income group people. During COVID, there was a rumor that fish can be a way to transfer COVID to human health. So that impacted negatively in the market so there was a low demand for fish so fish sector is impacted by two ways that is reduced fish price and then increased feed price so this is the common thing or uh, typical supply chain of fish in bangladesh uh, farmers about 60 percent of their income comes from fish but for vapari arudan and small retailer it is around 90 percent of their income comes from fish but due to COVID-19, they are severely impacted. Here, there is a there are few farmers who also is a hatchery owner, so they are very badly impacted because when the first COVID was emergent in 2020, uh, that is uh, March, so that is the breeding season for fish, so they are really impacted. And please go next. So if if you see the Next slide, please. If you want to see the price changes in the fish market, you will see that uh, before COVID, the price, next slide, please. The before COVID, here you can see that fish price before COVID and after COVID and during COVID. So fish price, particularly the aquaculture, tilapia and silver cup mostly consumed by the small and low income group people in Bangladesh. And the price of this fish also uh, reduced, but the feed price on the other hand increased. Uh, that is incurred the losses for the fish farmers. So I'm going very quickly, please, uh, next slide. So the common strategies of the fish and rice farmer is almost same, please go to the next slide. Uh, here we are talking about that, uh, uh, government has given some responses by providing website 
and some pickup van for the producer group so that they can sell their fish um, and this is the food security situation i'm not going to discuss it because the time is very short i'm talking about this issue uh, response of the government government provided some pickup vans for fish producer organization everybody can use this website for selling their products but please go to the next slide but in response to that uh, as the first presentation talk about that many farmers using ICT here in Bangladesh also fish farmer also using ICT or direct sale to the fish consumer this is the emergence of new technology for fish uh, selling it was not uh, existent before COVID due to COVID many farmers are using mobile phone and their internet for selling their fish and still it is continuing next slide please so what they are expecting from the government to cover these losses uh, they are asking about to reduce the feed price and other inputs and subsidize loan from all valuation actors and also they are demanding some um, training for their improved fish production and marketing and also particularly the, the fishermen they are demanding for allocation of open water bodies among the fish farmers sorry i i am taking so much time so that is all about my presentation recently we have published a paper on uh, review of covid impact on fisheries and aquaculture sector in developing countries so our findings is similar to that findings so thank you so much for your listen over to nick Great. Uh, thank you so much, Humnath and Monaro. Um, once again, if uh, you in the audience have questions, please submit them using the question box. Um, our fourth and last presentation will be given by Abut Hayat Mohammed Saifal Islam and Marcel Gatto. Um, they are from Bangladesh Agriculture University and SIP, the International Potato Center, respectively. They will provide some insights into the impact of COVID-19 on several actors in the value chain for potatoes uh, in Bangladesh. And with uh, with that, over to you, Saiful and Marcel. Uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, as Nick already mentioned, that our presentation title is Effect of COVID-19 on Potato Value Chain. Myself and God, Marcel will be presenting. At first, I will go, then Marcel will take over after a few minutes. So next slide, please. Uh, as we all have already heard three presentations on COVID, and, uh, and particularly the last presentation already talked about the COVID situation in Bangladesh, particularly in the agriculture sector effect. So as COVID-19 affects, particularly in the potato sector, like the increasing demand for table potatoes, on the other hand, processing potatoes actually is kind of oversupplied. And potato is one of the important crop uh, not in all over the world, including Bangladesh. It is the third most important food crops after rice and wheat. And it's also a staple crop for 1.3 billion people in, in all over the world. And as I said, it's also important for Bangladesh. Yeah, next slide, please. Then uh, I'll talk about the motivation why we did this study. As we often see, particularly in the after the COVID, most studies focus on the staple crops like rice, wheat, and others, but often don't focus so much on potatoes, though it's important crop, as well as mostly focus on farmers or consumers, but the hidden middle, particularly the other actors, was not so much focused. So in that respect, our study covers all the value chain actors. And next slide, please. And uh, the background about the COVID-19 situation in Bangladesh, there are three times lockdown from started in March, May, then April, then in July, another round of lockdown affected uh, all the agriculture sector, I mean, all the sectors. But effectiveness of lockdown in Bangladesh is often kind of the questions actually, because uh, particularly in the rural areas, people don't follow so much maybe the lockdowns that may be also affect our results we will come in a minute then uh, potato production in bangladesh is about like 11 million tons annually and uh, often it's like 30 percent is surplus in bangladesh and we hypothesis that this lockdown 
and, and other COVID-19 related measures which will disrupt the value chain, like particularly the labor input as well as the markets. So under that hypothesis, I mean, we try to focus on the uh, assess the COVID-19 impacts on the value chain as well as how the value chain actors adopted with the COVID-19 will be presenting. The next slide, please. Then uh, we, as like the others, is based on the phone survey. We conducted in seven districts. Its purpose simply selected because these are the main producing areas in Bangladesh. You can see in the map like the Dinaspur, Rangpur, Bogura, Munshigan, Joshur, Shatkira, and Kulna. These are the major potato producing hub in Bangladesh, and we selected for surveying and the different value chain actors. Next slide. Here we surveyed a number of value chain actors from seed enterprise, farmers, traders, cold storage, until the processors. You can see the sample size uh, dominating the farmers and the traders. Other sample size is quite low because it's sometimes it's difficult to reach particularly the processors and business people. Next slide, please. The materials and methods, as already said, this is based on the phone survey. We recall 2000, basically 2019 is the before COVID-19 and 2021 is the after COVID. But in some cases, we also recall for 2020. Then we use the existing data, actually ex existing contact from our previous survey and data was collected in from july to october and the analysis mostly descriptive statistics also use some sort of t-test and over ols and profit model next slide please here i uh, will talk about the results you can see at first we asked like whether all those value chain actors are concerned about the covid 19 or not in zero to ten scale you can see almost all the actors are very much concerned. The average is like eight within the figure zero to 10. And we also ask whether they're optimistic about the impact of COVID-19. They're also, I mean, in the kind of the 50% uh, within zero to 10, they're optimistic about the COVID-19. Next slide, please. Then uh, in impact on income and food security we ask like how the income changes compared to 2019 for all the value chain actors you can see here like the lower this year compared to 2019 is the highest i mean like uh, 70 to 80 percent of the value chain actors they says their income is lower compared to 2019 then follow-up question we ask whether this related to COVID-19 or not, the uh, upper slide, you can see the income change is related to COVID-19. Yes, it's, it says like 80 to 90% for all actors. They say it's related to the COVID-19. That means COVID-19 affect their income. Then follow-up question was like, what are the measures actually COVID-19? Like uh, here, inability to work because of the business was closed, movement restrictions, then the, also to consum reduce consumer demand. And the, most of the cases, they say movement restriction was the most severe effect on their income, followed by pandemic. I mean, the reduced demand for potato as well as the inability to work. On food security, some question we ask like, since the pandemic, have you ever worried about no food, healthy food, few food items? Is I mean, all farmers and traders mostly they say about 60% of the farmers and traders are worried about some of the food security aspect of their households. Next slide, please. Then we also ask about the price. Here, actually, we asked three times, like 2019, 20, and 21. And you can see here the price kind of 2019 was lower, but 2020, it was higher. Then it bounced back to kind of 2019 price. So in, in on almost all the actors and the uh, in 2020 price was higher but it's difficult to kind of uh, say this was due to the COVID-19 but that time it was related to the supply shock actually. Then we have another question on hard labor use. You can see in the upper portion of the slide there this says like 
uh, you can see the higher this year compared to 2019, they use more hired labor. And here we had several follow-up questions, but mostly like they use hired labor because of the supply increase, maybe kind of uh, returned back from the city areas to the, to the local, maybe in one reason, as well as some uh, farmers says, be, uh, some actors like the price was comparatively lower compared to other years. Then uh, potato trading or selling by the different actors, you can see the farmers more or less the same for traders, it reduces the changes, you can see this negative in 2021 and other actors uh, like cold storage more or less the same seed business is positive, I mean means increases little bit but processors and traders, it reduces the uh, compared to 2019. Next slide, please. Uh, here we ask about the expected profit from potato business from different actors. You can see here kind of mixed effect. I mean, kind of no effect you can say also. I mean, the positive maybe or negative most of the cases. The high bar you can see increased by like less or equal to 10% is the highest for like farmers, uh, trader and cold storage but also decreases uh, for like 10% as well as 30% for trade as they say decreases their income. Then another follow-up question also we asked like credit sometimes is important in Bangladesh, particularly we are the uh, um, home of credit actually, particularly micro credit. Then we ask for the access to credit here, it shows like 40 to 60% actors have the access to credit. Then uh, earlier presenter I already mentioned several measures taken by the government related to uh, COVID-19, but here, unfortunately, uh, our actors, almost like 80 to 90 percent actors, says they have not received any government aid uh, since the pandemic. Next slide, please. Yeah, I'm done. Now I am requesting Marcel to take over and continue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Saipo, and uh, thank you, Nick, for the nice introduction. Since we are the last presentation, I hope you don't mind if we have another strict 2.5 minutes of the presentation. Um, thank you. Um, so, as you can see, average potato production increased by some 230 kilograms between 2019 and 2021. Here, a detailed look reveals that the increase is a result of about 50% of the sample is actually increasing the potato production, while the other 50% is reducing the potato production, which is actually an interesting finding. So we further explored. While these findings could simply be the result of a seasonal variation in potato production, rather than the effects of COVID-19, the findings remain striking. So we further investigated the determinants of whether a farmer had a negative potato production between 2019 and 2021 using a simple probit regression. So please focus here on the cells that are highlighted in orange. We can see that highest seed excess is negatively associated with a negative production, or in other words, increases the likelihood of a positive production. Also, an increase in highest labor use is also negatively associated with a negative potato production. Both variables underscore the importance of accessibility of inputs for potato production post or amidst COVID-19. Total land size as a measure of wealth and potato price in 2020, which was actually much higher than the normal average prices, are both not associated significantly with a negative potato production. As increasing prices often determine potato production the next season, right, which seems not to be the case, suggests that there is more to the COVID-19 story than to the seasonal variation story. Farmers that are more optimistic about the COVID-19 pandemic have also a lower associated negative production, clearly an association rather than a causation. Striking is that there is one particular district, Dinajpur, that appears to be very different from all other districts. Farmers in Dinajpur had higher likelihood of a positive potato production, possibly access to inputs such as quality seed and maybe even hired labor were more readily available in Dinajpur as it's also a major seed producing area compared to other districts. Next slide, please. In addition to the COVID-19 effects, we also investigated mitigation strategies the five actors adopted. For the traders, mitigation strategies were several. Taking out loans was the most common one. 
for farmers, changing the different work was most often reported, followed by selling crop at lower prices, taking out loads and selling livestock. For cold storage owners, these mainly sold produce at lower prices. We found for business owners that these also adopted ICTs, such as online booking and payment systems. Next slide, please. Let us conclude. First, we found a major and heterogeneous impact on potato value chain actors, right? All actors are quite concerned, but also optimistic about the COVID-19 pandemic. Self-perceived indicators of income and food security were also negatively affected. However, the so-called potato activities of actors were not so much affected, as we observed little difference in key variables before and after COVID-19 hit. This suggests that other agricultural and non-agricultural activities were potentially more affected than potato activities, suggesting in turn that potato may be contributing to household resilience. However, a deeper analysis also showed that potato production was significantly affected, more so by COVID-19 than natural se seasonal variation in production. Areas with access to seed and hired labor had a more positive effect on potato production. Clearly, more analysis is needed to disentangle the difference between natural production variation and effects of COVID-19. All mitigation strategies that you can see here also focused on more short-term over longer-term mitigation strategies. Thank you very much for your attention and back to me. Great. Uh, thank you, Saiful and Marcel. Um, next, we are pleased to have Sudha Narayan uh, from the South Asia Regional Office of IFPRI to provide some feedback and commentary on the uh, presentations. Uh, Sudha, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank uh, all the presenters for uh, a very interesting collection of studies. Uh, in my discussion, I would like to focus less on feedback and more on, on just a commentary. Uh, what I'm going to try here to do is to uh, go across all of these studies which cover coffee, potato, fish and rice, very different types of commodities and value chains from three diff very different contexts. And uh, I'll try to see what I gather as a reader in, in terms of the lessons we can learn. Uh, I also have uh, other comments or questions which are more of a wish list of what do we learn from this about resilience and government policy. So I'll split my uh, discussion into three parts, uh, impacts, uh, adaptation strategies, and recovery. So when you look at the impacts, I, I'm just uh, uh, amazed at the kind of consistency in results we are getting, not just from these studies, but also from many other studies that have been ongoing since the pandemic. Um, in terms of what matters. So on the one hand, that is the demand uh, collapse versus su supply restrictions that have pushed up prices, a demand collapse that has uh, pushed down, uh, supply restrictions that have pushed up prices of inputs, demand uh, reductions that may have uh, collapsed uh, prices that the producers can get, but also the fact that it's heterogeneous across the value chain, depending on the restrictions and uh, opportunities that come up. Um, and then, of course, is the crucial thing of transport and marketing. Uh, it, it is, of course, any value chain actor that's engaged in the marketing segment, dependent on transport, whether of inputs or outputs, uh, has been disproportionately affected. Uh, and it's also very clear that if you're connected to export markets, the international supply chains, uh, shipping issues, container shortages, all of that have also had an impact. Um, and uh, I, uh, one of the things that is also clear is the timing of the survey matters. I think the Ethiopian coffee study clearly suggested that uh, uh, the timing of the lockdown uh, mattered. Uh, the timing of the survey, of course, matters because your perceptions and recall can also change. But clearly, the timing of the lockdown had an important uh, implication uh, on whether they are domestic or export markets. Uh, but also whether they are food or cash crops. So you see that uh, rice, fish in Bangladesh in particular uh, were perhaps less affected uh, relative to uh, shrimp, for example, which we studied, which were disproportionately more affected. And in that context, I was a little puzzled and, uh, about coffee in Ethiopia on whether it's both an important domestic commodity and an export commodity that it seems so resilient uh, in ways that uh, we have not really seen in uh, many other supply chains. 
Um, I also had this question in my mind on the relative maturity of sectors. So those sectors that have been traditional crops with long uh, uh, experience in marketing where value chains are fairly mature, perhaps they tend to be more resilient than others which are newer sectors or where value chain transformation is still ongoing. And that's something we perhaps need to understand a little better when we compare across countries and value chains. Uh, moving on to adaptation strategies, I was struck by how in Kenya, for example, uh, most of the adaptation strategies seem to be private in the sense that uh, actors are left to their own devices to find ways to adapt. And in contrast, uh, I felt that Bangladesh, you had a lot of conversation and discussion about government intervention. And in between these, I was missing a little bit on collective action. So if you look at private action, government action, and then there is a space for collective action, which in some ways I think we saw in Bangladesh through farmer producer organizations. And I think we need to understand more about these adaptation strategies to understand the role of government action. Uh, because we have sectors like rice in Bangladesh, which have heavy intervention from the government already versus those that are largely uh, uh, dominated by private sector participants. So to what extent does government, collective, and private actually come together or not uh, that actually uh, improves the ability for value chain actors to adapt? And that's, uh, I feel, an interesting area because many qualitative studies have shown that many value chain actors, especially at the producer end, uh, ended up, depending on collective, uh, action to uh, actually reach, overcome the challenges of the market. And on another level, if you look at very developed value chain, inter, uh, very uh, integrated value chains where there are big businesses, they too get together to uh, lobby with the government for favors and uh, restrictions. So um, it would also be interesting to see in these three broad categories of adaptation strategies, how are these differentiated between the large players versus small players or highly vertically coordinated uh, actors versus those that are not? Um, and I think these adaptation strategies will also feed into what kind of recovery we see. And I think we use recovery uh, quite uh, without quite defining what we mean. Uh, and we are seeing that we, we think of value chains as being largely resilient. And we talk about recovery as having happened. Uh, but I think uh, the interesting thing that all these presentations talk about is uh, do some of these adaptation strategies actually stick? So are we going back to an old normal or are we moving to a new normal? Uh, and what does that new normal look like? And I thought the Kenyan study pointed out the idea of electronic payments as being something that might stick. Uh, and we saw this electronic use of ICTs mentioned across all of the uh, presentations. So are these then, uh, are we seeing the, uh, via this crisis and the adaptation strategies or a, a sort of seeds of a transformation of the sector itself? Or is it likely to go back to what it used to be with, with time? And uh, that is something we don't quite understand at the moment. And I think it's important for us to link uh, government intervention strategies and what the new normal will look like. Many countries have, of course, used the COVID crisis to push through structural reforms in the agriculture sector, uh, India being one example, which is where I, uh, where I am from. And uh, whether this is also this inter intersection between adaptation and a government policy push towards transformation of these value chains. Is it ongoing? Is it going to happen? What are we going to see? And to, uh, to kind of conclude, uh, uh, in, in terms of resilience, uh, I, I, I this, I'm just thinking aloud here, uh, we see this dominance of private adaptation strategies across surveys. Uh, that seems to be the most common thing that they can do, the simplest thing they can do. And, uh, I think I mentioned this idea of mature value chains versus those that are undergoing transformation uh, constantly. Uh, are we seeing the, the difference in resilience also reflecting which point of the transformation they are in value chains? So if you think of mature systems, perhaps these value chain actors are the fittest or the, they've already survived a lot of challenges. And so the resilient, you would expect them to be resilient. Whereas in things that are more in flux, where it's segmented, there are multiple uh, types of actors, 
perhaps that's where you're going to see a shakeout or and uh, an exit of uh, some actors and the inclusion of other new actors. And I think at a sectoral level, um, it would be great to bring all of these studies together and imagine what it is that we are going to see and what it implies for state action uh, in terms of uh, both uh, uh, policy in the face of catastrophic risk as well as promoting an, uh, a framework that will uh, enable value change transformation that's sustainable. So I'd stop there and again I want to thank uh, all of the presenters and Nick uh, for giving me an opportunity to be here. It was uh, excellent, uh, an excellent learning experience for me. Uh, thank you and over to you Nick. Great, uh, thank you Suda. Um, I think uh, you raised a number of really interesting points. One that I'd like to highlight is that that question about, you know, as we return to normal, you know, as the uh, restrictions are lifted and the lockdowns are uh, removed, um, what will the new normal look like? And um, are there things that have changed during the pandemic that might um, persist beyond uh, the, the pandemic itself? And, and I think uh, the idea of uh, greater use of, um, uh, of electronics to, you know, of ICT uh, in uh, identifying buyers and sellers in, in finding prices and things like that. That is something that might may um, uh, that may persist uh, uh, after the epidemic. Uh, epidemic. So um, now it's time to open up for the um, Q and A session. And so I invite all the speakers to turn on your webcams and keep them on for the remainder of the event. Um, and uh, to those in the audience, please continue to submit your questions uh, through the question box, and we will do our best to um, address them. Um, okay, so turning to the questions, um, where do I find them here? Um, Okay, uh, this was uh, a question uh, from uh, Sandro Kassan, and it was uh, it was posed during Seifel's question, uh, Seifel's uh, presentation. So we assume that it is uh, addressed to him. Um, the question was, um, why has the selling price of processors continued to increase throughout the 2019 to 2021 period? Um, any, um, I, I hope this is addressed to Sifo, the, the uh, question didn't specify, but, but just based on the timing, we're assuming that this is for Sifo. Uh, can you address that, or is that, um, do you think it was for you? Yeah, thank you, Nick, and thank you uh, for the nice questions. If I understand correctly, I mean, it's not only for the traders, the price trend that we have observed for all the actors like 2019 was a bit lower than 2020, it increases quite a lot. Then 2021, it and become like uh, more or less 2019. But we have several follow-up questions actually, whether it's related to the COVID-19. We often see this is, this was not related to the COVID-19, rather it was major supply shocks actually in 2020 uh, for the potato sectors actually that's why then next year like 2021 potato production increases this is like the production cycle in economics we call cowboy model when the price increase farmers increases the accurate of the production then it becomes again the i mean price become uh, lower again actually that's kind of things we observe actually yeah. marcel maybe you want if you want to add something Okay, that's all doesn't have anything. Uh, Thank you, no, that's fine. Uh, he, uh, I think you're muted, Marcel. I, I mean, we understood what you're saying, but we have something to say later. Um, later, Tom will be working. Um, okay, here's the question. Sorry, was there a... Okay, um, here's a question for Gachal related to the uh, uh, Ethiopia coffee value chain. Uh, 
It's a question from Morgan from Imperatus. Um, what do you think explains the lack of effect of COVID-19 on Ethiopia coffee value chains, uh, particularly compared to other value chains in the countries discussed today? Um, is this related to the characteristics of the coffee value chain itself, or is it related to the way the disease manifested itself in Ethiopia and the government's uh, response to it? Uh, tough question, but <laughs> over to you, Gashal. Thank you, Nick. It's um, yeah. It's it's. Thank you, Morgan, for for the good question. Oh yeah, also tough. Um, yeah, I would say it's it's more of like yeah, more of you know, to to the context, uh, especially you know when uh, the first COVID nineteen was confirmed and the the disruption started in Ethiopia. It was uh, by mid March, and by then. You know, most of the actors, most of the uh, upstream actors, has done their job when it comes to coffee, uh, except uh, exporters. So that's a peak period for international export. And during that time, we also picked that there was effect on exporters in terms of uh, contract cancellation, transportation cost, also in terms of delays in paperwork. But that was uh, uh, short-lived. Uh, and then um, there's also a bit of um, uh, cyclical effect that we need to explore further. So one is the timing, as I said, and the other is coffee production has a cyclical element. Uh, you know, there are good harvest years and bad harvest years. And 2019 uh, was relatively, you know, wasn't the best year. So we need to look into that also a little bit more. And to 2020, the production were uh, higher, both in terms of value as well as in terms of quality because of the rainfall distribution, the you know the the, the environment, uh, the production environment it, itself. So it's a combination of the two. It's the production context, also like the timing of the the disruption. Kashal, just a follow-up question. Um, did you or have you looked at uh, international prices? Uh, do you know that, like perhaps uh, an increase in world coffee prices might have yeah. softened any of the negative effects uh, related to to COVID? Yeah, we are ourselves. We didn't look into that, but uh, at the early stage, there was uh, a price analysis done by uh, Bart and and other colleagues to look at comparing international and domestic prices there's always this divergence between <laughs> international because if your price and local price it kind of adjusts with some some delay but it, it was it wasn't it wasn't like clear to attribute that to covid-19 there was another factor at play the government instituted a minimum support policy right before or around covid so it wasn't easy to distinguish which, which one is uh, at play in terms of uh, uh, price. Again, the coffee price is very volatile, and and it, it wasn't. It's it's hard to to associate with with, with COVID. Okay, um, thank you. Um, so um, I have a question for Ben and Diego. Um, so uh, I thought it was it was interesting to hear that there seemed to be an increase in the concentration uh, based on the Gini coefficient. And I think that was uh, among traders. Um, and uh, I'm wondering whether this was, or if you have any information, about whether this is related to changes in the volume handled by existing traders, or maybe a change in the number of traders. For example, uh, did smaller traders uh, drop out of the business and that would cause a, a some concentration, um, or was it just a shift in volume among the existing traders? If yeah, you great question. Have information on that, but <laughs> that, that, thanks, Nick. So, yeah, really good question. Um, it wasn't only in traders, but particularly for potato, it was uh, in in most segments. Um, it was a bit more variable for fish. Um, but yeah, it's, it actually, it's, it seems like 
most of the actors in most segments continued their business, but they just continued, um, you know, at a lower level. So particularly in the case of the Tater, they were working fewer days per week. Um, and in both cases, they were trading a lot less volume. Um, and so we, it, it looks like a sort of redistribution of the, the remaining volume that's being traded um, sort of among the actors rather than um, people dropping out um, as, as far as we can see. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Um, and uh, to get that larger concentration, I guess you would need to have uh, a reduction in volume among those who were relatively small scale and either an increase in volume or maintaining the same volume for the larger players, um, uh, if I understand that right. Yeah, or it could be a reduction across the board, but the, the smallest people are, are sort of getting the, the biggest relative. Uh, draw. Mm. Right, okay. Um, Good. Um, okay, um, I have a question for uh, for Humna. Um, your study shows that the price of rice increased, um, partly due to an increase in demand and partly due to movement restrictions. Uh, so the question is, where were these uh, price data collected from? Is this uh, are these prices in uh, Dhaka or uh, prices in a smaller um, surplus areas. Uh, in theory, we would expect movement restrictions to reduce prices in the surplus zones while at the same time increasing prices in the deficit areas, you know, with sort of like an increase in transportation cost. So so I guess the question is, uh, where were those prices um, collected and might it be different if you were uh, looking at uh, uh, prices elsewhere? Yeah, that's a very great question. Uh, we have a lot of data that we collected, uh, both at the grower's price, so wholesale price and retail price. Uh, but we, I, uh, what we presented is one is the study area in the, the remote rural area, that was the wholesale price. And then the other is the retail price in Dhaka. So it represents both the rural price as well as the urban price. That uh, only two price uh, we presented in this slide. Uh, but uh, everywhere uh, the price uh, has increased, even in the rural area. The, one of the good things uh, about the COVID last year, not this year, but last year, uh, the, when the COVID started, uh, there was some panic in the food market because rice is a staple food. And then all the markets were talking about that there will be food crisis and then price will go up. So everybody was uh, stocking their food. Uh, so that causes both a retail price as well as the uh, farm get uh, price increase substantially. Uh, but this year, when it comes to lockdown this year, the retail price is still remain high. But uh, farmers were not, uh, the, there was no panic in the food market. And then uh, farmers were not able to sell because of the lockdown and the traders already have their stock. So the farm price went down, but the retail price is still remain high. So that's the very contrast between the last uh, lockdown and this lockdown. Okay, yeah, and, and I guess that's consistent with um, what we'd expect from economic theory that you know, if, if you make it harder to get a product from the producers to the consumers, the consumer price should increase, but the producer price should should decrease because it's, you know, sort of bottled up in the in the production zones. Um, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, um, and uh, I have one uh, response for sure that uh, she raised one question, maybe, maybe after the all the questions I can uh, answer that. Uh, no, go ahead. I actually, I meant to ask if anyone had uh, responses or comments in in response okay. to Suda points. Yeah, yeah, so far. She, she, yeah she raised very important uh, and very relevant question about the is there a, the uh, the interaction or the partnership between the government, private sector, and then collective action. Uh, and that's what exactly what we saw the, in terms of the mechanization in Bangladesh. Because during the, the when the COVID started, it was a rice harvest time, and then labor movement was restricted. So the, there was huge crisis in the labor. 
and then the government wanted to supply the machines, the harvesting machines, and then uh, this uh, the, the tracing machines. But it was with the private sector. So what the government cooperated is the with the the, the work with the private sector, public-private partnership, uh, to move those private-owned uh, machines to the rural area where we did the study, and then they work with the community groups. Uh, to utilize that and provide that service to the community. So the government, and this is the first model of public-private partnership uh, at the government level, and then working with the community in terms of mobilizing that at the village uh, level, because it was a first time. So I think, and then uh, the community also like, and they were demanding that we want this type of uh, mechanization service in the future. But the challenge was this is the first time they are supplying these combined harvesters and sometimes they were not working so what the community wanted in the local level some training to use those machines and then build some local service providers within the local village so that the, this becomes more effective so there is already some model we can see this uh, public private as well as the collective action and thank you great uh, thank you Ma Yeah, uh, just a follow up of uh, Omnath. I would like to also respond a little bit on Shuda's interesting comments and observations, particularly three things I was thinking to mention uh, regarding the collective actions. Of course, I think it's important, but you know, it, it varies from sectors to sectors as well as crop to crops or different nature of the crops. But also we observe like social networks, particularly in the developing countries, actually, I mean, social capital kind of things also play an important role in the adaptation of any, I mean, not only in COVID, such type of pandemic or any kind of uncertainties. And we observe in our data set also, particularly in terms of credit, we often, we have seen some actors rely more on the friends and relatives to for taking credit rather than getting from the formal source, maybe the bank and other things actually. So uh, social capital or social networks also plays an important role for adaptation, I think. And another one, ICT as a, an adaptation, we often and we have seen in all the presentation, including in ours. I think this will continue uh, even after the pandemic because actually this trend even started before the pandemic if I see in Bangladesh or other developing countries like particularly, I mean, this food system transformation we are talking about nowadays. And I think that uh, COVID-19 actually kind of speed up the food system transformations using all those ICTs. So I believe like this will continue and it, this will speed up the, I mean, uh, the food system transformations. And uh, the dominance of the private adaptation strategies already, I think, uh, Hamnath already mentioned. But we, are, we have seen like public-private partnership in, in Bangladesh, as mentioned, in rice sector. But some other sector, or maybe the private is dominant, like let's say vegetable sector, is the seed sector in Bangladesh, vegetable seeds is dominant by the private sectors, actually. But in the rice and others, is government mainly dominant since long time. It's kind of historical and also rises political crop in Bangladesh. So, yeah, thank you, Des. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Saifu. Um, any other uh, comments, either clarifications or, yes, Diego. Hi, Nick. Uh, mine is a question. I know I'm not supposed to ask questions being one of the presenters, but oh, I have a question. question. You answer that. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, as you know, as part of the COVID hub, particularly on the value chain fractures working group, we have uh, conducted several studies, including a stock taking exercise, basing, basically is a, a meta-analysis of the uh, publication, the literature that have been published up to a certain point, I believe more or less up to towards the January perhaps of this year. But that time, the studies were primarily qualitative. It took some time, you know, for this quantitative study, and also thanks to PIM and thanks to the COVID hub for funding. Now we have more, uh, we have more results from quantitative studies. So my question is, uh, 
how do you see the opportunity of bringing these studies that have a key characteristic? They are mostly be conducted using the same approach. So I think we can really conduct super interesting comparative analysis. But here I want to link back to Suda. Thank you, Suda, for the great feedback. You raised quite important points about the heterogeneity of these studies and the heterogeneity of these results. It depends largely on the different characteristics of the lockdown when they have been imposed. Now, how the government has, has, has reacted when the survey was conducted. It was a very interesting case on the coffee value chain, for instance. And, uh, and many other characteristics, uh, food versus cash commodity, uh, more or less linked with international trade, more or less perishable. There are many factors that come at play. So my, my question is, uh, how do you envision, particularly now that we are closing up with, with PIM and the COVID hub as well, what can be a good platform that can help us to, to, to look further and not only then to publish our amazing results, but also to try to bring them together and trying to see more uh, stronger lessons for the future? Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, excellent question. Um, not many yeah. want to answer. <laughs> Um, I think, uh, you, you know, I think uh, with the closing of PIM and the other CRPs, um, we have a little bit, you know, less opportunity, less fora to uh, to meet and exchange ideas and, and, and less funding to, you know, push these into papers. But I think we all um, have an incentive to try to um, uh, work together and to draw some common uh, lessons from these uh, these studies. Um, and you're right, there are a number of studies. I know Flagship 3 has funded uh, at least seven or eight uh, COVID studies, most of them using similar methodologies. So there should be some great opportunities to collaborate. Um, I think that under the new one CGR reforms, uh, the a natural home for this would be under the Rethinking Markets uh, initiative. Um, it it doesn't have anything COVID specific in it, but I think that there is, uh, you know, possibly the opportunity for for using that to um, push uh, for synthesis of of this work. It's an important task and. Um, hopefully a combination of some modest funding from what <laughs> CGR and our own incentive to get this out will, will be enough. Um, we are uh, coming to the end of our allotted time. Um, let me just uh, uh, see if there are any more questions that have been added. I don't see any here. Um, well, um, I think uh, we have, as usual, probably raised uh, more questions than we have answered, but I think there are some uh, very interesting um, patterns emerging. Uh, I think uh, Sudha is uh, quite right in saying that there's a, a lot of diversity in uh, the impact of uh, COVID on food value chains, and it depends a lot on the timing, the government responses, the nature of the commodity, um, my initial impression is that a lot of the staple food crops are less affected than the high value crops, um, partly because they're less marketed. A lot of them are, um, you know, marketed locally or marketed within rural areas or consumed by the same household. And of course, the government is going to give priority. Um, no government wants to be seen as, you know, blocking the flow of a, a staple commodity. That would be politically very risky. Um, so, um, but on the other hand, high value crops, they tend to be more perishable. They tend to travel further. They're often being exported uh, as in the case of coffee. Um, although coffee isn't a great example because it seems to be less affected than many of the other commodities. But um, I am uh, optimistic that we will be able to identify some, some common patterns here and um, uh, some lessons that can be drawn uh, for policy. But um, I'm afraid that with the time and uh, that we have today, we'll, 
we'll have to leave it there. Um, so let me uh, end just by um, thanking all of the presenters for their uh, great presentations. Um, thank you to uh, Sudha for her comments. And um, I know you didn't get all the presentations until the last minute, so we really appreciate your uh, willingness to, uh, to take on this task. Um, and um, I think that uh, we'll wrap it up for today. Um, if you have any, uh, if you'd like to send comments or questions about today's webinar, um, feel free to contact PIM versus the email um, that you can, you may see on the screen or, or that is available from the, uh, uh, from the announcement that was sent out. Um, and the event uh, has been recorded and the recording and the slides will be available on the PIM website, which is pim.cgiar.org. Uh, and with that, I think we will close um, and have a great day, everyone. Thank you for coming.